come back to the ballroom. This is our second session of the plenary. And then, uh, as you may see in the schedule, uh, it should be uh, the panel of the three ministers. Ministers, but since uh, uh, our minist uh, two ministers are still on in the way to, to hear, but one uh, uh, has already uh, assigned uh, his uh, deputy to uh, talk about uh, the metropolitan issues and also policies regarding the infrastructure. So, please uh, welcome to our next speaker. So here we will, uh, in a moment, we'll hear the presentation of the head of the Regional Infrastructure Development Agency, representing on behalf of the Ministry of Public Work and Housing. So, uh, Pak Hadi Sujahyono, is uh, the head of the Regional Infrastructure Development Agency. So let uh, give him applause and place to share uh, the ministry's speech uh, to welcome us as an uh, ISO Cup uh, participant. Pahadi Suchahyono, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please allow me to convey apology from my minister, Pak Basuki, Minister of Public Works and Housing, because he still has a meeting with our parliament. And so please allow me to convey his speech on the 55th International Society of City and Regional Planners World Planning Congress today. The Honorable Minister of Agrarian and Spatial Planning, or who is representative from that ministry, the Honorable the President of ISOCARP, Mr. Rick Stevens, the Honorable Mayor of Bogor, Mr. Bima Arya Sugiarto, the Honorable Coordinator of Urban Planning and Design Branch, UN Habitat, Dr. Narang Suri, the Honorable President of Indonesian Association of Planners, Mr. Bernardus Gonoputro and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I'm honored today to be here with all of you, distinguished guests attending the 55th International Society of City and Regional Planners or ISOCARP World Planning Congress. In this occasion, please allow me to express my sincere appreciation. It is an honor to me to be invited as the speaker in this Congress session. Indonesia is rapidly urbanizing. Since 2010, more than half of our population live in the urban areas. This condition provides us both opportunities and challenges, as cities contribute the largest to the national economy. And at the same time, they bring problems which requires solution. As other urban areas in the world, our cities face traffic congestion, flood, growing slum areas, air and water pollution, lack of infrastructure, and so on. As our country is situated on the ring of fire, thus home to several active volcanoes, our city is also prone to disasters. Therefore, there is necessity to develop resilient cities. Our national policies, policies provide clear direction to develop livable, competitive, resilient, smart, and sustainable cities, as stated in the National Medium-Term Development Plan. The role of infrastructure development to achieve those goals is very significant. As we all understand, infrastructure holds a vital role in the development of this country. Infrastructure is the platform in constructing our economic development and therefore, increasing our country's competitive value internationally and reducing disparities among regions in the country. Infrastructure also plays an important role in, in reducing disaster risk, 
thus creating resilient cities and regions. Integrating urban infrastructure, which is one of Ministry of Public Works and Housing tasks, means recognizing their interdependencies and strengthening our system of cities by connecting them and provide human settlements infrastructure as well as our support for strategic areas. Indonesia is currently developing 10 national tourism strategic areas called as the New Bali. We are also developing 12 special economic zones, industrial zones, and especially metropolitan strategic areas, where we have now not less than 11 metropolis. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, there are, of course, challenges in urban infrastructure development in Indonesia. Several most notable challenges are high population growth in urban areas, land, water, and energy scarcity, integrated urban development program among stakeholders, and limited access to creative urban financing. However, under such challenges, within four years, from 2015 to 2018, we have successfully managed to build about 55 dams, 945 small dams, 782 kilometers of toll roads, 3,387 kilometers of new non-toll roads, 20,500 liters per second of drinking water, 23,407 hectares of slums, with better condition, and sanitation and waste management for 9.78 million of families, and also 3.5 million units of housing to cope with rapid urban development. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for the next five years, our President of Indonesia has declared his vision for Indonesia in 2019 to 2024 which is number one, accelerating and continuing infrastructure development. Number two, human resource development. Number three, opening investment opportunities to stimulate job opportunities. And number four, reformation in bureaucracy. And number five, focus efficient and effective use of state budget. Of course, it is a huge task ahead where it need to be done in integrated manner. One of the top priority of the President's vision is to relocate the capital city from Jakarta to East Kalimantan. The new capital city can be a great challenge for Indonesian planners, architects, and urban designers. It is also a showcase on how to develop a smart, green, beautiful, and sustainable city in Indonesia. I know we are not starting from the scratch since we will be able to make the best use of international experiences in developing their national capital cities, such as Putrajaya in Malaysia. Brazil, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hadi, for the remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information before we proceed to the next uh, remarks, we would like to inform you that we would like to invite you to the gala dinner that will held in the city hall after this congress. It, uh, it, we will walking towards the city hall by looking our surroundings through the Bot Bogor Botanical Garden. And of course, our mayor, Mr. Bima Arya, has prepared for the gala dinner and uh, he really appreciates if all of you can attend the gala dinner later, thank you. Now we proceed the next agenda with Mr. Andy as the lead. Thank you, Pa Hadi, for your uh, uh, remark for this. Okay, now uh, I think we can start uh, to deliver to this stage uh, to once again to ISOCAP uh, Vice President of Congress the one and only Svavek uh, Ledomir, Ledoyer. Ladies and gentlemen, Svavek. <laughs> Good
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, the pronunciation was perfect. I, I have a difficult name. Uh, so now, now uh, distinguished guests, uh, delegates, colleagues, friends, uh, we will continue with the part of the introductions that is touching on, uh, on the theme of the Congress. And this part will be uh, started with, with our two sponsors that also help us to deliver this, um, this Congress. And first of all, I would like to uh, in invite to the stage uh, Mark Funda. Uh, he's from uh, Doppelmayr. Mark Funda is a qualified urban designer with over 15 years ex of experience working for both the public and private sectors. He works for the Doppelmayr Group, where he engages with urban design and transport planning aspects when implementing urban cable cars. He has considerable experience across all areas of urban design and transport planning, including master planning, public realm studies, traffic impact studies, urban renewal, and regeneration. In addition to his technical skills in those work areas, he also skilled in streetscape design and assessment of access and utilities for developers. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Doppelmayr, for supporting us continuously, and the floor is yours. Hello, um, my name is Mark. I am from Doppelmayr, and Doppelmayr is a manufacturer of cable cars. And if I could see my presentation, that would be lovely. Could you? Okay. Um, so you might ask yourself, why is Doppelmayr here as a cable car manufacturer? Um, the reason being, we are also a mobility provider, and um, I'm an urban planner myself. And uh, Doppelmayr has now, for a de decade, started to build cable car systems for uh, cities. So um, we finished we uh, building the world's largest cable car network in La Paz. That's 10 lines of cable cars with an over length of um, 30 kilometers. So that's a cable car network that covers the whole city. Um, and as an urban planner, we okay. Here we go. Uh, as an urban planner, we are always. Oops. I'm sorry about this. Okay. I'm sorry about this. Um, okay, so um, while we are here, Doppelmayr is not just a manufacturer of cable cars, uh, we are a mobility provider. We um, offer advice to urban planners, to planning departments, uh, hold workshops to advise on new mobility solutions. And that's not just cable cars, that's all types of mobility. Um, so the next slide. Um, so yes, so we all urban planners know the problem when we plan a city, when we plan a development, um, there's a huge increase, there's a huge demand for space for public, in, tr public, for transport infrastructure. And while transport is vital for cities, we also find that it's always very disruptive. Um, so you see this is um, Los Angeles. Um, see the space taken by or over by um, transport infrastructure compared to the size of the slots of the uh, buildings where people live. Okay. Okay, so, but if we don't give enough space <laughs> Um, if we don't give enough space um, to transport, we uh, get congestion. But at the same time, giving more space to, um, to transport, um, 
it creates an induced demand. So, hope. so um, I wondered always whether um, placemaking and transport are two worlds colliding. Do they actually can live together, or is this uh, something we will never get together under one roof? And um, <clears throat> um, placemaking, when it started, it was much about giving more space to the people, to pedestrians, to other modes of transport, rather than giving space to the car. Um, those of you who know London might remember the uh, redesign of Trafalgar Square, where um, Trafalgar Square was created into more space for people rather than being a traffic island. So um, we say there is um, another way. We don't have to destroy neighborhoods to create space for transport. We um, go just a level up. Um, so we had a look at how would you implement uh, infrastructure for cars in a very dense urban fabric. And this is approximately uh, the space in red you need for um, cars, buses. And this would be um, the, the blue line showing a, a cable car network. So what we do is we move transfer to a new level. So cable car are an urban mode of transport. What started in the mountains as a mode of transport for skiers, for people skiing in the, in the mountains, is now um, arrived in the cities. So um, as we heard about, um, the transport uh, of the future is multidimensional, multimodal. We don't cater for cars anymore. We just cater for buses, MRT, LRT. So many, many uh, uh, modes of transport we, we, we use now. And sustainability is paramount. So it's inclusivity. So we want to make sure that all groups of the society can use um, to public transport. So if we say. Um, you need to consider all options. We would like you to consider the cable car too. So cable cars have become now a trusted component of transport networks worldwide. Um, it's always a mix of options. We are not saying uh, the cable car is um, the only solution, but we say it should be considered as a mix, as a part of the mix. So it's a new tool in the transport planners mix. So let's have a look how we use cable cars in cities. So we have a lot of experience now, there are a lot of case studies, and I just go through a few options how you can uh, use a cable car in a city. So the first one would be we leave traffic. We can build a cable car above a very congested street. This is an ex um, this thing. Okay, so I just go. Um, so we leave traffic, which means we can build a cable car parallel to a very busy street and add capacity to the transport network without putting more pressure on the road network. Um, a cable car can act as a bridge over a river, over any topographical um, ob obstacle on the ground. Uh, we have an example in London where the cable car crosses the River Thames. We can extend transport networks. We did this in uh, Bogota, in uh, Colombia, where we built a cable car as an extension of the uh, successful BRT Transmilenio. So the cable car and um, the Transmilenio use the same uh, terminal building, and you can use the same smart card to use both systems. Then we can act as a feeder. Um, this is a good example, it would be Caracas, where the cable car acts as a feeder to the metro system, and again, the metro and uh, the cable car are using the same station building for an, a seamless interchange. Then we fill gaps in the transport network where there's a gap where we need someone to connect two modes of transport. We connect um, in Portland. Why is this happening now? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then we can create transport networks as we did in La, uh, La Paz, Bolivia, where we um, actually the cable car network covers the whole city. So a few examples uh, I'd like to show you. 
to illustrate what I was talking about. So um, this is the San Agustin uh, neighborhood in Caracas. Um, on the left side, you see a figure ground plan, and this is uh, the buildings there. And uh, the original plan to connect the city to the central business district was to build a road through the neighborhood to get buses and cars in. But that would have required uh, the demolition of 30% of all structures. That means relocation of the residents who actually were supposed to benefit from the system. Instead, the cable car was built and it was almost like um, acupuncture. So only um, Horribly sorry about um, So what they did is instead of building the roads, they um, built a cable car and um, there was minimum disruptive to the neighborhood. They, made to, um, they managed to re retain the um, social structures in the neighborhood and to add social infrastructure within the stations. So. Um, Uh, Um, okay. Um, okay. So this is the cable car here in Caracas, uh, in the San Agustin neighborhood. Uh, we saw that building before. So on the top floor, we have the cable car coming into the station building. Then we have the ground floor, which is um, the entrance, and then uh, on the lower floor we have the um, natural system and you can use the same smart card for both systems no. I can't s I'm, I'm really sorry about this um, So um, I should work now. I'm really sorry about this. Um, so, okay. <laughs> oh my God, this is... <laughs> Thank you very much. So this is the um, Parque Central um, uh, station building. On top, we have the cable car coming in. Then we have the ground floor with the entrance. And then below, um, we have the um, a metro system. So this is a seamless integration to the wider transport network. You can use the same uh, smart card for both systems. And uh, this allowed actually all residents of that neighborhood access to work, healthcare, and education. Where do I point at, actually? Do I have to? <laughs> okay, well, okay. So this is the, um, this is the Transmilenio. Um, uh, the red line shows the Transmilenio BRT system. And up there where the cable car is, where the park is, uh, this is the El Tronal terminal. And um, this area here where the cable car is, is uh, a neighborhood of um, 700,000 people. So that's quite large people and some statistics say that a third of Bogota's population lives in that area. It's quite um, an area lacking of social infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and the roads are too narrow for any buses to go there. So those people, those, the residents of this area live quite close to the BRT system without having access to it. And as a part of the wider, wider regeneration program, um, it was planned to bring transport infrastructure into that area without destroying the community. 
So the cable car was built again. And, and you see here, that this is a terminal building. It's used by the cable car and the buses alike. So you have a seamless interchange, and you can use the same card. So the operator is the same operator as Transmilenio. It's now the cable car is called Transmicable. And then we have the Transmilenio, the bus, and you use the same card, and you have a seamless interchange between two systems. Um, it also served as a regeneration um, for the neighborhood. So the station sites are, are used as a catalyst for wider generation. So the stations have shops inside, medical centers, and also it was used, the opportunity was used to add a bit of green space to the neighborhood. And then the cable car, uh, any mode of transport can act as a catalyst for urban development. So we have, um, this is uh, La Paz. This is the cable car network um, with all the lines in operation. And um, Libertador station is the place where three lines meet. And it looks like this. It's actually a scrapyard. It's not used for anything. And it's really hard to get there. And uh, this is where the green and the yellow line meet and the, the blue line. <coughs> and um, it's not very attractive to go there. It's hard to get there. You have to use a car. There's a few buses going. But the cable car really is the main mode of um, um, access. So, but a uh, developer found that um, this site become actually uh, much more because um, he looked at the access now with a cable car and uh, started a design competition to develop this into a new central business district for uh, uh, La Paz and with the main mode of access the cable car. So the cable car here in this case acts really as a catalyst for development and we have other examples from La Paz and El Alto where the cable car actually with better access started a construction boom and boosted tourism. So this is a few of the plans from the competition. And also tourism is quite an interesting. Some of you as planners might be involved in touristic projects. And uh, we had a, we were involved in a concept study for a tourist resort. <coughs> there were three character areas. So one of them was the main port town, and then there were two, two bits, uh, two parts uh, on a hill side. One was more the hillside retreat, and one was seaside villas. And uh, the problem was um, the link to link the two areas. So there was one road winding, but it was all a protected nature reserve. So it was really hard to um, connect those areas. And um, the developer decided to use a cable car to connect the two cities. So it's not only, it creates a sense of exclusivity, but it's also for access control, and it preserves uh, the nature reserve around. So I'm just going to give you a brief explanation of the technology, just to give you an idea of the um, uh, capacity. So uh, the maximum capacity of a cable car is 5,000 passengers per hour per direction. And um, to move that, to move 5,000 passengers in two direction, you would 2,000 cars, each fully occupied by five passengers, 100 buses, or one cable car. So you see, and it's quite a difference it makes if you use a cable car for transport. So we believe the cable car is sustainable transport. So if you consider this, um, it brings all together. So if you provide transport to, to uh, deprived neighborhood. We allow access to health, to healthcare, education, and social services, and it has an economic impact. With an income, people are improved, they are living conditions, and again, if you don't use a car, we have a positive environmental Im impact. Thank you very much for this slightly chaotic presentation. Um, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for the introduction and presentation. Uh, we apologize for, apologize for the technical uh, issues. I hope it's fixed, looking at the team. Yeah. Uh, so now I would like to uh, invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Mr. Rami Hajar, uh, who is uh, uh, working for Philips, Philips um, 
Philips Lighting Country Leader and General Manager for Indonesia, uh, originally from Lebanon. Rami studied in Beirut and Paris, worked in different fields before moving to Dubai uh, in 2010 to join uh, Philips. And now he's uh, here in Indonesia as a general manager. So please, uh, the floor is yours. My presentation will be on technology, but my biggest worry is this for now, so let's hope it will work. <laughs> so, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salamat sureh, Baba Ibu. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, my name is Rami. I am heading Signify in Indonesia. Uh, Signify is the new name of our company, uh, used to be known for many as uh, Philips Lighting. So we changed our company name globally and we are now known as Signify. So we're gonna start the test now. Working. Um, so on that good note, I'm gonna start my presentation. So I'm gonna be talking today about smart cities. And uh, for me, I hear a lot about smart cities and I think there's a lot of technical uh, descriptions of smart cities that make many decision makers confused. So I always try to make it very simple. For me, smart cities have three characteristics. Uh, one, a smart city has to provide efficient services for its citizens. Two, for a city to be smart, it has to use uh, energy and resources efficiently, wisely, so that's two. And the third one, you cannot have a smart city that is not attractive, enjoyable, and safe for its citizens. So three simple characteristics for a, sm for a smart city, and we're gonna be talking about it today. Uh, there was a study uh, done by Forbes. They do it actually every year, and they rank 180 cities in the world, uh, how smart they are. And regularly for the last few years, uh, the top three smart cities in the world uh, were New York, London, and Paris. Also part of the 180 cities uh, was obviously our capital city, capital for today, at least, uh, Jakarta. And um, it had ranked in 2016 as number 170 out of uh, 181. But the good thing is that in the last three years, Jakarta has been making phenomenal steps to go up in the ladder. So uh, they are now at around, uh, so they jumped around 35 places in the ranking in just three years, which is something I would say quite uh, phenomenal as well. So however, just to note that to transform into uh, smart cities is not easy. I mean, cities are obviously facing challenges. And uh, looking at the presentations uh, today and what Fahadi also uh, presented about urbanization, I think this is the biggest challenge that cities are facing today globally. As we know, 50% of the global population is today in cities, and by 2050, the number is expected uh, to be at 70%. Again, to put it into local context, for Indonesia, this means that we're gonna have more than 200 to 220 million people living in cities. So the challenges are tremendous. There's a big stress on city operators to provide still good services and also we have higher crime rates usually, uh, pollution, energy usage, and so on and so forth. So quite a lot of, of challenges. One of the biggest challenges is obviously uh, the massive requirement for infrastructure. Again, heavily aligned to, to the presentations uh, that, uh, that were presented also today. So uh, there's a study that says that in Indonesia specifically for the next 10 years or 11 years, around 1.2 trillion US dollars uh, has to be spent on, on infrastructure. And, uh, and the thing is that with growing population, the biggest challenge for the cities is to spend it on infrastructure that is scalable. So let's say today we invest on something uh, for a certain number of population and in a couple of years, we'll have few million people more then this adds a lot of uh, pressure on the investment on infrastructure. So what type of infrastructure that is smart 
and scalable is the key question now for uh, cities around the world. Second uh, challenge, second big challenge is uh, the, on energy and uh, resources. So there's something called energy productivity. It's not really used a lot in, uh, in our economy. We talk about energy efficiency, but there's something very important called energy productivity, which is the measurement of GDP and the economy divided by energy used. So as you know, like when you have your, uh, let's say you have your kid who's uh, 10 year old, uh, if he wants to grow, he needs to eat. And uh, the more he eats, the more he grows as well. If you deprive him from food, he will not grow enough. Same applies to economy and energy as well. So let's say in Indonesia where we talk about yearly a growth in economy of five plus percent, this growth in economy requires usage of energy. And if every year we want to grow the economy, we need to be mindful about the energy that we use. The good thing is that Indonesia is ranked not bad, I would say, at a global level in terms of energy productivity. So Indonesia is ranked today around 52, uh, number 52 globally. But just to also put it into a global context, uh, we are in Indonesia ahead of uh, France. France is at 56. We are ahead of the US. Uh, 80, around 87. We are ahead of China, around 111. But still we have 50 countries ahead of us, so still some room of improvement too. There's also something called energy productivity improvement. So the globe is improving at a rate of 1.3 percent. So we use better the energy to get economic growth at 1.3 percent annually. Indonesia is around 2.5 percent, so double the global uh, improvement rate. So that's also a good sign. But again, Indonesia's economy is bound to grow uh, at a higher rate than the global uh, average as well. So as such, we need to always maintain this energy productivity too. Last big challenge I'm going to talk about is, as I said, a smart city uh, has to be, as I said, a beautiful city, attractive, safe. So when cities around the world are growing, there's also intercity competition that's happening as well. So cities around the world are fighting today for resources. And some of the most important resources are talent and cash. So for talent to be attracted to cities and talent to bring with them innovation, and with innovation, we stimulate economic growth. So to attract talent, you need a nice city that has a nice city image. And this is where cities are working on it. And also to attract a, a di foreign direct investment, you also need a safe city, a stable city, and a beautiful city. To give you an example, if I give a talent sitting here today an offer, a job offer, let's say to work in uh, Paris for uh, $10,000 a month, and then I give him another job offer to work in my home city, uh, Beirut in Lebanon, for $12,000 a month, most likely this talent will go to Paris, given how Paris is perceived, given the city image that Paris has. So this is a very simple example, but it, behind it there's a big, uh, a big fight and big competition among cities to attract these talents and to attract also uh, the investment behind it. So what do we do? What do cities do to overcome these challenges? Obviously, they revert to technology. And why technology? Today, this year, on the years uh, around this year as well, technology has reached a place that's quite advanced to help overcome these challenges and to help cities advance and become smart. So everybody here has uh, mobile phones. As I can see, some of the mobile phones are already in your hands right now other mobile phones in your pockets. So just to give you an example, the computing power in your mobile phone that is now sitting in your hand is higher than what Neil Armstrong had in 1969 when he landed on the moon. So now this is the power of technology. It is in your mobile phone, it's in your pocket today. So as such, the power that the technology can give us today is massive. And when we talk about technology advancement, and when I gave you the example of the mobile phone, we talk about data. And the power of data is phenomenal as well. And uh, 
when we talk about data, we talk about IoT. I don't want to bring also a highly technical topic, but let me explain in very simple words. What is IoT, Internet of Things? Um, imagine sensors everywhere and wireless communication. It's as simple as that. So when you have sensors and wireless communication, this is where you move to Internet of Things, where everything around you is connected. And the power of data is phenomenal. IoT went through three revolutions with time. First revolution when Internet was used uh, on fixed connections like computers. Second wave of revolution uh, of IoT when you had your Internet on your mobile phones. And the third revolution that we are witnessing today is Internet of Things. So everything around you can be connected. And you can imagine when we go to this level of connectivity and data and power of data and power of control, the things that could be done to cities and to transformation to smart cities as well. But there's one thing, we we'll talk about Internet of Things, there's one thing, if you look around right now, around you, in this room for example, it's available everywhere. Wherever you go, it exists. So if we leverage this one thing, we can have immense, immense use of Internet of Things. Given that I told you where I come from and which company I work for, I think you have a hint already. Lighting is everywhere. So lighting, no matter where you are, you need lighting. And it's a very simple technology that is now getting so advanced to the point where every single light point can be connected. And the power now that we can bring through lighting and Internet of Things to cities is immense. Just to put it into perspective, as you can see here, there's around 50 billion light points installed in the world. I know that everybody has a mobile phone or two, but just also to put it into perspective, every year around 1.3 billion mobile phones are sold, while we expect 14 billion light points to be sold. So still, lighting is a much, much bigger, uh, I would say, uh, platform for Internet of Things than mobile phones, then PCs, then TVs, you name it. And that's why industry leaders and uh, industry players in lighting are now focusing most of their efforts in terms of R&D on developing connected solutions. But given that we have many city operators and mayors sitting with us today, let us focus just a bit more, zoom in a bit more on public lighting. So there are around 300 million street lights in the world, most of them quite old, 20 year old. Um, Usually street light consume around 40% or total lighting consume around 40% of the city's energy. And only 2% of the total public lighting is connected. So still the opportunity to improve is, uh, is definitely phenomenal. So what we bring to the table when it comes to public lighting is something called Interact City. Interact City is an IoT platform and it's a very simple IoT platform where through, your, through the laptop of the city operator, you can control every single street light in the city. You can know the energy consumption of the city. You can dim the light or increase the light depending on the event as well. You can do scheduling. For example, at midnight, let's say you reduce the light. Uh, when we come to the morning prayers in Indonesia, people go out of their homes, you increase the light, so there are many things that you can do with it. If one light point doesn't work, you have, you know exactly where it is, automatically goes to the maintenance team, and uh, the maintenance team fix it instead of what we do today in most of the cities, going around or waiting for a phone call from a citizen to tell us that the street light is not working. On top of it, and most importantly, energy saving can reach up to 70 and 80% as well because of the scheduling and dimming and the technology used, which is obviously LED. So it's a very simple IoT platform, but massively impactful. And it's not something super new now, so I think it's becoming a standard as we go uh, ahead. As an example, today, for us at least, we have installed that in more than 50 countries, 1,400 locations as well. On top of that, besides the typical use of lighting, uh, it can go to much more than that. So for example, the street light points uh, can detect 
uh, noise. So uh, we call it acoustic monitoring. So let's assume that there is a car accident or uh, there is a gunshot that happens in the city. So the street light detects it, sends a notification, and then you can either send this notification automatically, let's say to the police, or you, if you have cameras, you can just check it out on the cameras to see what's going on. So from safety perspective, uh, it, it's also, uh, it has a phenomenal impact as well. On top of that, we monitor air quality, so we can know the air quality, we do live air quality sensing across the city. And this gives phenomenal uh, number of data and information points, so to know where we have higher pollution, what time we have higher pollution, what needs to be done. Even at the citizen level, if you make it public, you can know is it the right time to go for a morning run or maybe better postpone it to a later time. So many things that could be done to also improve the pollution in the city by monitoring it, also through street lighting. It's important to say that this the smart street lighting, as I said, is not something that is, uh, as of today, not accessible. And if you, just to put it also in the local context, one of the biggest installation globally for smart street lighting is Jakarta. I'm not sure if you know that or not. So for instance, at least for us at Signify, or formerly known as Philips Lighting, we have around 160,000 smart street lights in Jakarta itself. So today, Jakarta can control most of their street lights, again, from one room, uh, have phenomenal energy saving and also do the, all the scheduling, dimming, maintenance automatically. So this is happening next door and, uh, and uh, we have around 32 cities already in Indonesia uh, where we have already installation of smart city, uh, smart uh, uh, public lighting basically. So Interact City tackles two of the three challenges, right? We talk about efficient services and we talked about energy usage. There's one more for a smart city. We said smart city has to create the right city image. And what we do also today with something as simple as dynamic lighting, smart lighting, is we help cities create these images. So again, to go back to the Paris example, if I ask you now, what is the most important landmark in Paris, something that stands out, comes to your mind, what would that be? Which one? Sorry, I cannot hear. Yeah, I heard, I heard someone said Eiffel Tower. Um, and that's a true answer, that's a correct answer. Eiffel Tower is one of the most iconic uh, uh, landmarks in Paris today. But think about it. Uh, Eiffel Tower, and don't get me wrong, I love Paris, but it's a structural steel monument. And uh, without proper lighting at night, it doesn't stand out at all. So just with dynamic lighting, a structural steel monument becomes such a beautiful, beautiful landmark that creates a positioning that is phenomenal for a city like Paris and ends up attracting millions of tourists and talent to Paris. Again, I may be oversimplifying things, I'm sure there are many other things as well that the city worked on to create city image, but this is just a small example of what dynamic lighting can do. I have many other examples, Empire State Building in New York, London Eye, London Bridges, New York Bridges, Pyramids at Night, so many more, but, uh, but the whole idea is to just tell you how it can help transform uh, uh, a city image. We did one bridge in, uh, in California and after one year, uh, the city operators came to us and told us that they did a study and realized that it impacted the economy by $100 million. So just because many restaurants opened up and uh, uh, employment was created. I'm just going to show you a quick one-minute video on an example on that. That's an example from uh, China.
So that's an example from China that we did recently as well, which impacted the local economy uh, substantially. This is a very important slide, at least for me personally. On that slide, you can see the world at night. You can see the amount of light pollution in many countries using light points that are not energy efficient. You can also see countries deprived from lighting. If you look at Africa, for example. So you see the link between lighting and economic development. Countries without lighting struggle economically because the economic output is impacted. After sunset, nothing can be done. And countries with a lot of lighting are not using lighting efficiently. So we can say here that light is required, more light is required, but definitely more efficient light. We walk the talk, so this is our commitment as a company. Next year we're gonna be 100% carbon neutral. We're already almost there. And uh, we're gonna have all our uh, energy uh, coming from renewable electricity by 2020 as well. Our hope is that cities as well walk the talk and put the right policies in place. And this is where public-private partnerships come together. We need to provide our input, and I think the cities also need to walk the talk and put in the right policies to enable it. So with that, I would like to thank you, and I'm gonna be around. If you have any questions, it would be my pleasure to answer it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rami. Thank you, Signify, uh, for the presentation, also for supporting the, the, the event. Uh, and now, without further delay, I turn my eyes to, to Martina, Martina Yuvara. Uh, she's founder and director of urban strategy company Urban Silence in London. Extensive experience at international level with strong uh, Mediterranean and Arab uh, experiences. Active member of smart city professional scene in London but most of all, of course, active member of ISOCARP, dear friend of ours, and now uh, took on the big role of, of being a general rapporteur for this Congress. This is a person that leads the Congress team throughout, uh, throughout the content side. So now I leave the floor to Martina to tell us more about Beyond the Metropolis and why we are here. Thank you so much. Now is my challenge to see if I operate, if the presentation comes up, and if I can operate the clicker. Okay. So my name is Martina Juvara. I'm the general rapporteur, meaning that I, what I have done, I've been coordinating the content of the development of, of the project uh, of the Congress. And I am not, a <laughs> I'm not an academic. If you look, if you Google me up, you will not see big papers written by me, but you will see that I'm, in, I'm doing interesting projects and I'm working, maybe I move this as well. As well. Yeah, thank you. I'm more comfortable that way. Um, I'm doing interesting projects and I'm a practical person. Uh, what interests me is what actually works, what makes cities better, what makes places better. So I'm less interested in the theory, the names, etc. If it works, it's good for me. Um, I've also been a member of ISOCARP for about 10 years. And if you're not a member, become one. It's a very interesting organization. I've been doing loads of interesting things with ISOCARP. And one of them was in 2016, I was in Prague with a group of us uh, at the UN Habitat Congress, one of the regional preparation congresses uh, for the UN Habitat and the Sustainable Development Goal New Urban Agenda. And there, there were loads of interesting presentations and loads of interesting ideas, but there was one statement that remained with me ever since, and this is the one. And it's the one that I hope you will all know already, but is the battle for sustainable development will be won or lost in cities. Uh, that, to me, is a very important statement because it encapsulates several concepts. One, it is a battle. It needs energy. It needs effort. It doesn't happen by itself. It's not going to happen by itself. And then the second 
is that cities are clearly very, very important. Now for uh, the um, academics of you, I think you will, not, will, will cringe, you will not like what I'm about to say, but I would like to change the word sustainable development. I know it encompasses lots of things and is the framework for good city life and for, for the way forward. And I fully subscribe to that, but I would like to change that word and to make it something a little bit more understandable, something that my father-in-law would understand. And I would like to change this with this statement. The battle for humanity will be won or lost in cities. It's really the battle for us as human beings, for our hopes, our uh, fulfillment, our way of life. If we don't manage to create good cities for all of us, then we have lost the battle. And we have to uh, really put our efforts and our mind in that and bring it home. Bring it home to everyone. It's our future as human beings. There in uh, Prague in 2016, also another interesting statement was made that we need a conceptual shift. We need to consider urbanization as a positive tool, a tool for change and development, a tool for the future. It's not just an accumulation of problems. We shouldn't necessarily focus on the problems. Every city has problems, but it is, or every environment, there are problems but we have to focus on the opportunities and on the positive qualities that urbanization brings. And um, hopefully we are gonna have Shipra uh, that was with us in Prague in 2016 and now has joined UN Habitat to give us an update of the next level, the next step of thinking at, in UN Habitat. So that would be in the plenary AM on Wednesday. So as I say, I wouldn't want to focus too much on problems. Of course, cities are full of problems, you know, congestion, overcrowding, and um, uh, failure, market failure, or affordable housing, or all sorts of things compacted. That picture is a summation or, or shows that issue. I don't want the Congress, I wouldn't like the Congress to focus on the problems. I would really like us to focus on the solution, on the solutions themselves. Um, I was last week in, uh, uh, in Italy, I'm Italian, and I, I was visiting my mother, and my mother brought me to visit a house of, a, uh, of an art collector. The art collector, uh, the, the house is now a museum, and there was a video in which he was, uh, uh, he was interviewed, and he was asked why he spent all his life and his money uh, collecting art. What, why was he doing it for? Could he not just enjoy life in another way? And, oh, this is not what he said, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's later on. So, um, it, what he said was, if we don't get, if we don't understand culture and the culture of humanity, then we are not going to be able to um, to resolve the problems of the day-to-day -day life. Without understanding the culture of human beings, we don't understand how to solve the problems. So. I would like the Congress to focus on solutions and to focus on opportunities, uh, on children, on, on fun, and on what, um, li uh, what cities bring uh, to life. So track three, I would like to recommend it to you, uh, livable places and healthy cities, children and cities and planning for the future. Uh, this is an important track. It will start tomorrow with, with a conversation on planning for children um, with um, UNICEF. Another important aspect another important aspect in urban um, living is, cult is culture and cultural identity. And with this I'm not only talking about the heritage, the big palaces, the big temples, but the culture of every day and the culture of all of the diversity on the different population and the different street life that happens in cities. Of course, Jakarta is rich of many of them, but every city is what makes every city different. And so this is a very, very important theme and track four is gonna address that. So they, it's gonna focus on the knowledge and culture 
uh, the knowledge economies and identity and how to manage local identities, particularly when the cities are such a large scale. It's very important that individuals feel at home, feel that their culture counts and their culture uh, uh, makes a difference. So, but this is not only the one aspect, this is only just one aspect of, um, of cities. We are also in, in big times of change. Uh, we've heard that, you know, we have heard lots of statistics and lots of data, but I would like to bring that home uh, more at the, our sort of like personal, personal experience of change. Of course, we are not in the only time in history where change happens. Um, change, but this is the time in which we are aware of it, in which we can measure it, and we, we know, we are aware in all parts of the world uh, that change is happening. So I just would like to bring it uh, to the human scale. So, for example, my lifetime period. I don't consider myself old, but a lot of change happened. Since I was born, Dubai, when I was born, Dubai was a small city with uh, just, not even a city, it was a village of fishermen and with just straw, straw buildings and a few mud palaces. So the change from there to the city that we have today in the lifetime of a person is immense. But also cities like London that when I was born were already mature. But London was very different when I was born. It was a city that was losing population and a city that had a failing industry or industry was closing and moving out, uh, lots of pollution, smoke. The smoke that you see from the chimney there is now the Tate Modern, it, it is a gallery. So th the change in London in the lifetime of a person has been immense. Uh, now London is a city of innovation, is a city that is privileges, uh, human scale, uh, consistently and clearly in its policies. It started not long ago, but the change is very significant from public spaces to transportation uh, by bicycle to enjoyment in the street, plus innovation centers and so on. Istanbul, equally in my lifetime, it went from less than three million people to 15 million people. And in the process, some streets, like the Istikal Kadesi, that is a city, the, one of the central commercial streets, changed dramatically in the same period with the growth of the city. So all of this, of the discussion about the scale and the relationship between different parts of the cities and how they grow and change is gonna be addressed in track one. So if you're interested in this theme, please go to track one. And then I would like that little girl there is my daughter. <laughs> and uh, this is just to say, it's not just in my lifetime, in the lifetime of an adult but it is in the lifetime of children, in the lifetime of a person that is now not even 18, or just turned 18 just now. Entire cities are being grown. So this is a city in Chinese Mongolia and was a village, so it was infancy when my daughter was born. When my daughter went to primary school, the city already had a structure, already had a framework, was already moving into adulthood. My daughter was learning to read, the city was already becoming an adult, or was preparing to becoming an adult. In 2012, when my, my girl went to secondary school, the city already had a structure and was starting in its second wave. And in 2016, my daughter, still a child, the city was 30,000 people. So what I would like you to realize today is that in the lifetime well, in the time that it takes to bring a human being to, into adulthood, cities are now born and created and fully formed. That is the speed of the development that we see in some places. And I think that that, I would like you, the statistics are fine, the numbers are fine, the graphs are fine, but think that, think in the life of, a children, or of our children, in our lifetime, the amount of scale and scale of change that we are experiencing. And this is not enough, it's not only, this is not a unique case. Or Putraya was exactly the same, uh, Songdo the same, uh, New Cairo in Egypt, satellite city to the main Cairo city. This is, was planned in the 1990s, in 10 years, 2006, 2012, 
2016, again, in the life of the teenager, it became a fully fledged city. So we have to respond very quickly to this change and be quick on our feet, not only be ambitious, but also quick on our feet. And if you're interested in the role of peripheral cities and what's happening on the side of the bigger city, there is track two uh, that is going to look both alternatives, but also the role and context of what's happening um, around the cities, around the larger cities. Of course, the Jakarta experienced the same thing here. Uh, I just show you very briefly that this is the southwest of the city, just in the lifetime of my daughter. Look at the scale of change, it's massive. We have a huge, as planners, we have huge responsibility to address this, to be able to manage this and to create good places, good places to live. Of course, there is the theme of the new capital that has been discussed. New, uh, new capitals, you have a list here. These are purpose-built capitals. Uh, there are a few more and a few ancient ones. Uh, it's not a frequent occurrence. New capitals are not invented every year. It's a very complicated issue. It's a very fast track issue. But also what happens in the new city needs to be complemented by what's left behind in the city that is no longer a capital. Not to have a, a, a flea of business and a flea of, of uh, um, activities that move out of the city. So what's happening? So it's two cities that need to be planned at the same time. And it was mentioned before, the special session on the capital city is tomorrow at two o'clock there is going to be a debate and several presentations on this topic. Also, the way we live in cities has changed dramatically. Now here, all of you, you know this, uh, so I don't, but I just want to, you to focus on the dates, how we change. We change the way to shop, but we are, we are able to start and do internet shopping just because now we have credit cards, and credit cards <coughs> have been unable for fast, fast processing, but it's not the technology that is more than 15 years old. In 15 years, loads of things, loads of habits have changed and have enabled new businesses like Amazon to become, and Alibaba to become the businesses that they are, just on the basis of in introduction of new technology and in the span of the lifetime of our children. Of course, new ways to work. The reason I am here and I can work and I can access uh, my files and send to my clients over there uh, the files that I was supposed to send is because there is Google Cloud, there is cloud services that I can access my servers from wherever I am. So that is also uh, 10 years, about 10 years old and that enables a completely new way of working. And of course, cities are connected, interconnected. We have new mobility, new patterns and all of this of course, is in track five. If you want to know more, there are loads of interesting discussions and interesting presentations there. We talked about livability and we talked about culture. We cannot, we cannot plan for, for the correct culture and we cannot plan for the life of other people if we don't in involve them in the planning somehow. That of the participation and that of coming uh, of joining together ideas is essential. And uh, this is part of a big discussion in track seven that is about governance. It's gonna address all of the institutional issues of metropolis and boundaries and administration, but also uh, have a discussion on democratic and participatory planning. And finally, very important, but you would expect that, that's why I put it last, our relationship with the environment, our relationship with the client, how climate, and how that will change and shape our future and our cities. So this is in gonna be in track six. But also there is a link, there is another session uh, on Tuesday, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. that links the Congress of last year that was, all, was called Cool Planning, um, that was the relationship of planning and the, and the climate. And that is gonna take place as a special session tomorrow morning at nine as well as track six. So here is a little bit of the flavor of what's gonna be in the Congress. But I want really to engage you as human beings. I want really to call upon you as people, as individuals, 
really arm yourself. Use this week to arm yourself, roll up your sleeves, and prepare yourself for battle, for this battle for humanity that needs to be won in cities. It cannot be anything else. Be exhausted. Uh, just go around, learn, listen, talk. There are over 200 experts here that are going to be very generous with their knowledge, their experience, what they know, different countries, different cultures, different ways of doing things. This is a great opportunity for all of you to go back home full of ideas, exhausted like mad, but uh, having enjoyed and having um, profited from the Congress and make new friends and make new contacts because this network is what creates the possibility, new possibility for the future. More than anything else, and this is my nearly last concluding statement, please, please, please don't go back. Don't go back to planning as usual. Don't go back to bureaucratic, slow, uh, concrete down planning. Please don't do that. That is going to be the biggest mistake that we can all do. Um, so with that, with this recommendation, embrace change, look at opportunity, embrace culture, look big, think big, and make new friends and make new contacts and arm yourself for battle. So, <laughs> so with this, before in introducing you to the uh, to the track uh, the team, the team that put together the actual content, that review all of the presentations and shaped the content of the Congress. Just these are just a few highlights for me. I, there will be loads, loads of interesting things and I'm really sorry because I will not be able to go to everything. I will go to as much as possible. I just want to mention one thing that is probably behind the chairs for you down there. At nine o'clock on Wednesday, there is the um, Isocarp special reception. So if you're not a member, please become one so you come to the reception. But also if you're a member, please come. It's a social event and it's a way to look at the future as well from the point of view of the organization. And of course the organization is as good as the people that are part of it. So now I would like to invite all of the clever people, far more clever than me, that prepared and helped uh, with the Congress. I will call you uh, in pairs, so that people are in pairs, and the, uh, also the uh, Indonesian experts that are associated with this team are invited to come as well, and so that they, you see who they are. So, first track, track one, um, limitless cities and urban futures. So, if Wen Jing and Steve can come up, we had Peter Newman also helping, but he couldn't unfortunately um, participate. Uh, Budi, you were there before. Can, can you come? Oops, I clicked by mistake. Thank you. So, of course, this is a very important topic for Jakarta, that of the mega city, but also the way the mega, the, this large city is actually not only has a scale, but has components within it, and how the relationship between the components and the symbiosis is going to be um, is potentially manageable. So the discussion is going to be in that team. So I, uh, then I would like to invite track two, beside the mega city. This is a very important topic, Tatagata and Fedor, and Adiwan and Arya, if you can come up. <laughs> this is a critical topic, is our mega city is the only solution? We can only go big? Or, and also, if we, do we have alternatives? But if we don't have alternatives, how do we work with what it is around, around the cities? And for example, for example, for Jakarta, is it strengthening the interland and offering connection, offering new possibilities and new defense to avoid just the limitless expansion of cities like Jakarta? Track three, livable places and healthy cities. We have Jens and Mahak, and Indonesian colleagues. This is, of course, we've heard uh, throughout the afternoon how livability and the livability index 
is now very high on the political agenda here in Indonesia. And this is an opportunity to learn from UNICEF and the, the work of UNICEF and other organizations, but also uh, the, way to, uh, the way in which other countries are addressing the same issue. Track four, knowledge, economy, and identity. So if I can invite Nassim and Piotr. So again, um, the identity and the diversity of culture, of cultures that are present in Indonesia as a country so, so diverse, but also in the cities of Indonesia is, is, is also a very relevant topic here. Track five, smart future and sustainability. We have Dorota and Adriano Vizello who was called in at the last minute to replace our ways, Piracha, and also Abdullah Kamarazuki. <laughs> Track six, uh, environment, risk, uh, climate change, planning for resilience and the role of people uh, in resilience planning. So, Yuani and Marcus, and the Indonesian colleagues. And then finally, governance, planning profession, Jenny Lee, Eric, Katie. We've heard um, how there is a drive to understand uh, in Jakarta, the cities that have outgrown their boundaries and their administration boundaries, and so this is a very relevant topic, but also the importance of democratic planning, and we have some special sessions for that. So I would like to invite you all um, to give a round of applause to the wonderful team that you have. And feel free to ask any one of us. Um, any one of us sort of like more detail about the team and we are looking forward to seeing you all very busy and participating in the discussion the debates being active active participants within this within the tracks thank you very much Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina, for uh, the opening introduction. Uh, I feel there is a lot of interest to discuss, and, and uh, as you have seen, uh, there are a lot of different opportunities to, to listen and discuss and attend different sessions, so we encourage you to that. But to add to that uh, introduction, I would like to uh, invite Matt Lally, uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, Matt is a highly experienced urban designer and Town Planner has worked internationally on wild uh, ranging portfolio of major planning and development projects in both public and private sectors throughout the world. Uh, he has experience of encompasses sub-regional st strategies, new settlements, major urban regeneration, transit-oriented development, housing renewal, and many others. The list is really long. Too long. Too long. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to, to, to Matt, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a very great pleasure to be here. And uh, Martina has just um, uh, expressed that she wants us all to be exhausted. And in that, I, I fear that she may have already, the, her objective may already have been met. Um, I'm conscious that several, many of you have flown from all over the world and are probably struggling and battling with a bit of jet lag. Um, so I do, um, uh, I ask for your patience and thank you very much for, um, for, for keeping your eyes uh, open for a, for, a few, for a little bit longer. Um, I'm going to provide an overview of some of the challenge we face as planners and urbanists in planning for the megacity. Um, and I think some of the things that I'm going to touch on are, are universally applicable to, to cities of all um, sizes. Um, I'll start with some broad context before looking at each of the, the themes as they're structured uh, in the seven tracks of the Congress. Um, I certainly don't claim to have all the answers, 
Um, I'll be asking a series of questions and some provocations along the way um, and asking our esteemed uh, panel to, to join us afterwards to, um, to, debate, to, to debate some of the, um, the points that are raised. Now, the moment of truth. Does the clicker work? Yay! Okay. So, um, in terms of, um, we've heard a lot about the, the growth of cities, and um, I thought it was fantastic the way that Martina contextualized it in relation to um, the, the aging process of a daughter, and, and I thought that was so powerful. I'm going to sort of contextualize it in a slightly different way to say that we've all heard about um, how uh, the, um, uh, we have a pre approximately 55% of the world's population living in cities and how that's going to uh, expand over time and is projected to stabilize somewhat uh, come 2100, uh, 85%. Um, and so within that context, I think, you know, looking at that 100-year sweep from 2000 to 2100, um, we can sort of reflect on this being a particularly pivotal moment in time that the city, the, the, the city planning choices that we make now will, make, will fundamentally shape the system of cities for the next century. So, you know, we have a tremendous responsibility in, in that sense. Spoke too soon. Um, and then just staying, we're all familiar, I'm sure, with this, but, but just again, sort of, you know, putting this in the global context, 2010, 52% 52, 52 of the population uh, living in cities. Come 2020, we're up to 56%. And by 2025, China will have more than 220 cities with populations over 1 million and 8 megacities over 10 million. And, you know, it comes as no surprise to all of us that we see that concentration of urbanism in Asia in particular, with uh, most of the 40, 43 megacities with more than 10 million inhabitants projected by 2030 to be in developing regions in Asia uh, and in Africa in particular. And come 2050, um, it looks something like this. And again, it really sort of serves to accentuate just you know the, the, the degree of intensity that's being brought to bear uh, on Asia. Um, some recent um, research here uh, from, uh, fr from uh, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle looking at uh, the, cit the city momentum index uh, as they describe it and uh, they have done a piece of research which they update on a re regular basis. You can debate some of the indicators that they might use but they uh, attempt to identify the world's top 20 most dynamic cities. And this is looking at a very short-term horizon, looking at the next three years. And um, a 19 of the world's top 20 most dynamic cities are here in Asia, reflecting the, uh, the continuing sort of pace of change uh, in the region. And if we look at uh, the, uh, a little table here of megacities, we can see that 14 out of the 25 world megacities, again, are here in Asia. And you can see Jakarta here at a similar scale to Lahore, 